So this is a follow-up to a presentation I did um, a few years ago um, at this, uh, this meeting. I have no disclosures uh, to make. Um, in 2016, I presented an argument for regionalization. And at the time, um, talked a little bit about the, re the concept of regionalization, a regulatory process um, in which resources are allocated, and utilized parallels in pediatrics, um, in pediatric heart surgery and ECMO, uh, to talk about how the performance and mortality is improved in complex medical situations when your numbers are higher. And I did a review of the, uh, the National Burn Registry and compared it to our uh, data that uh, we had. And some of the takeaways from that, that talk was that the data does support the concept that illnesses that require a quaternary level of care um, will have improved outcomes with a higher caseload. And we were talking about the catastrophic pediatric burns, um, the greater than 40% uh, category. And these are the burns that, in my estimation, require this quaternary level of care. Around the same time that I presented this data, there was also a publication um, out of Oh, I'm blanking on her name now, um, out of the West Coast, in which the, um, they reviewed the different centers, the burn centers around the country, and found that centers with higher volumes had improved mortality when it came to pediatrics. Um, and our burn center, when we reviewed our data, had a much lower mortality than that published in the National Burn Registry. What that also means that there's other centers with higher mortality so that it averages out to the number that the NBR um, does. So the, the proposal at the time was that large, greater than 40% pediatric burns would be better served by moving them to a few specialized centers. The pros would be that there were going to be potentially better care, better outcomes, and easier to do studies. Uh, the, ob the cons are obvious. There's longer travel for families, there's billing issues, and there's loss of skills at smaller centers. But really, if your child had a 60% burn with an inhalational injury, where would you want to go? Would you want to go someplace that did one of those every two years, or did 10 of them per year? Okay. So this time around, the objective was to design, actually put together a nationwide model that groups catastrophic pediatric burns to a few specialized centers best equipped to care for these complex high demand cases. So how many centers do we need? Okay. So I wasn't sure. We went to the, I went to the NBR data and I used, the, again, the 40% threshold to look at the pediatric distribution. Now, the NBR actually counts pediatrics as less than 20 instead of less than 18, so it's not exactly perfect numbers, but they're pretty good. And so the average of those numbers, and remember the NBR is a 10-year rolling average, so I took a I guess you could see three consecutive publications and then averaged it out and got 144 catastrophic pediatric burns per year. So that's the numbers we're trying to distribute every year. Is there a magic number? I, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, in pediatric heart surgery, we know that the mortality increases um, when you get below 200 cases per year. In ECMO, pediatric ECMO, your mortality is best above 20 cases per year, and that's from the ELSO registry. From, from our data, which again, we know was improved over the NBR data, um, that we had a 12.5% 12, 12 mortality, and we were doing about 6.5 patients per year. So a, back, um, a model was developed. What did I do? Uh, I looked at all the verified and unverified burn centers in the US, total of about 140. Uh, I eliminated all the definite um, adult-only centers. I looked at admission numbers. If, the, if they only posted their um, overall admission numbers, I looked at about one-third, which is typically what most people will post for their pediatric data. And then I looked at the statewide populations um, for the entire country. Okay. 
The considerations, now, you know, this is, this is if, if I'm going to start divvying these up, uh, where am I going to send them? I've got to consider the center's previous experience with pediatrics, okay? So you do more, there's more likelihood you're, you're going to potentially be one of these centers. Um, now, pediatric resources versus burn resources, that's an, that's an interesting debate. When you get up into this quaternary level of care, you're going to need a lot more subspecialty help, especially when, when you get into the world of pediatrics. It's going to be burns plus peds, plus peds cardiology, plus peds ID. So, you know, th it starts to pile up the amount of subspecialties you need. Location, 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 as any realtor will tell you. Be, if, you're, if you're going to take people from a lot of surface area of the US, make it easy to get there and get out. And ideally, I kind of wanted an even distribution around the US. Things I was not considering, things I tried to leave out, who I like and don't like, okay? That I tried, now, I don't have any real skin in this game. As a pediatric ICU doc, I'm kind of outside the surgical world. Um, and I would like to think I have at least a little bit more objectivity um, when it comes to, comes to doing something like this. Yes, we are, our, our center is the, is the largest in the US, so we're gonna get one, but you know, our satellite centers are likely not going to necessarily um, be these, um, these referral bases. And then the ABA certification, well, you know, there's some um, places that take pediatric burns that don't do adult burns that obviously can't get verified by the ABA. So, first model I put together, I used that magic number. I kind of paralleled it to the ECMO cases and looked at tw 20 burns per center per year and got a total of seven centers. Okay, and this is kind of the distribution I came up to, which, you know, it's a lot of turf, okay? That, it's a very large um, rural areas, okay? There's just, it's, that's just, a, I didn't like that one, okay? Um, plus, it's gonna create a lot of differential workloads. You've got some covering four states, you've got some covering 11 states. There's gonna be markedly different transport needs and it just seemed too spread out, okay? So I tried a, a, the second model mimicking our six to seven large burns per center per year. That would give me 20 centers nationwide. Decided to kind of draw my lines and now I'm getting a little bit crowded. Okay, there's a few states that I had to cut in half and cut pieces off of. Um, it's just, that one just looks a little, a little crowded to me. I didn't like dividing up states. And, you know, the upper, upper left corner still, I don't know if there's anything we can do about that because that's a lot of rural area. So I split the difference. Decided on four centers, 10 burns per center per year. Seemed like a nice happy round number and came up with at least what looked like a better model, okay? And this, these models are designed to um, kind of divide up the population as much as possible into even increments. Yeah, California still gets in, split in half, but you know, we can make comments about California all day, so. Um, it wasn't too crowded. Uh, the rural states, I can't do anything about that. They're gonna have to be grouped together and there's probably gonna be a transportation issue that remains. Okay? And then I kind of assigned locations. Okay? I tried to just basically put it in the city category rather than um, the institutional category. Um, you know, the, the, the debate, you know, one example of kind of the internal debate I had was with regards to Texas. Obviously Dallas versus Houston and Galveston. I combined Houston and Galveston simply because while Galveston certainly has a lot of pediatric experience, it's not exactly you know, a major hub of the world. Um, it's, not, it's a little bit more difficult to get into and out of. Dallas on the other hand, Houston on the other hand, you know, much easier. So I combined Houston and Galveston versus um, doing it at some place like Dallas. But again, these are, these are very legitimate debates this is just kind of my, you know, initial run at this to try and try and put something together. Okay. The rural states, again, I can't do anything about that. There's going to be a longer transport. This may actually 
add to our mortality when we want to talk about the risks of doing something like this. There's also um, a risk of resource utilization. When you look at length of stay for these patients, they're obviously a lot longer. So if you use this 14 center model and you average about a greater than two month length of stay according to at least our data, then you're looking at 663 patient days per center. Um, that's mostly going to be ICU time. So they are taking up space for a longer period of time and the accommodations are gonna obviously have to be made and there's a higher surgical and operating room uh, demand as well. Benefits, there's some benefits besides just your straightforward outcomes. Um, it's probably a good thing from a support standpoint if a parent has another parent to relate to with a similar size burn. I don't know that a 60% burn parent can relate to a parent of a kid with a 10% burn. They're totally different needs, totally different um, things that they have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, resources, um, if anybody's ever had to pull stuff off of a shelf because it's expired, because let's face it, they're all size dependent when it comes to kids, and you may not utilize them for your one or two uh, cases every couple of years and have to um, renew your resources because of expiration, this may cut down on that. And um, it's, gonna, it's gonna help from an experience standpoint with your staff. Research, any research targeting larger burns in kids, kids on the ventilator, is gonna at least be a little bit easier to do. But there are some unanswered questions. It's a lot of outreach. And how do you do school integration from 300 miles away? Rehab, follow up, obviously you're going to have to utilize the other burn centers, which are still gonna be doing their own burns in, a, in smaller sizes on kids, so they're, you know, we're not closing them down, it's just moving their um, larger burns away. Biggest questions, for me at least, I don't know that there's ever a good time to do a six hour transport if you've gotta go you know, a, a number of states away, but certainly the experience that the Shrine has doing those types of longer transports that they do um, is something that would be good to draw on. I, winter time in Denver, trying to do long transports, or Arizona from Denver, doesn't sound like a lot of fun. Um, Will that many large burns burn out my staff more quickly? And can I bill and collect from two states away? Okay. Final thoughts. As I put this all together, one of the things I kind of realized is that I actually used to be one of the guys referring to you all. Before I joined um, the burn center doing regular old pick you stuff, uh, I was one of those guys calling you up with, with large burns. Um, the mortality numbers that people put out with burn centers Speaking as somebody looking in to those numbers, the numbers are kind of meaningless because of the number of small burns, okay? When you've got 100, 5% burns, everybody knows expects the mortality to be zero. As you get up in complexity is where your mortality becomes statistically significant. When you look at the pediatric heart world, they report mortality based on defect. A VSD should have a low mortality. A single ventricle physiology has a higher mortality. The one thing that I would like, at least the ABA, to consider is should we be reporting differential mortality statistics based on complexity and severity? So I will leave you with that and open it up for questions and comments. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, this, what we believe to be a novel idea we had at the burn center here in San Antonio um, with virtual burn care. I have a nothing to disclose, standard Department of Defense disclaimer. So what I want to talk about today is the, what we did for recognition of the need, what we wanted to implement, what we did implement, uh, kind of a little bit of our initial patient experience, the challenges we encountered, and then what we believe is the way forward and the potential. So recognizing the, the, the need, we have about 3,000 um, outpatient encounters in our burn center every year with a very steady no-show rate of 10% every month. No matter what we've done to try to intervene on that to the point of calling every single patient prior to their first appointment in our clinic, if there's anything that they need uh, in the, with, with regard to assistance or rescheduling appointments to facilitate them uh, coming to see us. Um, and in spite of that, we have no, uh, we've had no effect. 
Um, there are some, some very significant barriers. I'm sure anybody else here in the audience here from a very large state can relate. Uh, distance uh, that patients have to drive relates to time off work, uh, loss of income. Um, patients with documentation status have the inability to, to, to go uh, certain areas. Uh, but driving to our burn center, if you look from Del Rio, McAllen, or uh, Midland, Texas, three to five hours is equivalent to basically driving from LA to Vegas or New York to DC to see your doctor. That's not really feasible. To give you an idea of what our catchment area is, this is a very rough estimate of uh, where our patients come from in the burn centers, uh, the ABA burn centers, um, the rest of them in Texas. So to attempt to uh, bridge this gap of patients who couldn't come, we did a, a bit of a test. We wanted to set up an off-site, uh, basically a burn wound care clinic in San Antonio at another uh, government facility. Uh, the problems we ran into, which made this a little bit of inhibitory for us, was the, the amount of training that the, the, burn wound, or the wound care nurses would have to do to be able to see wound burn patients. Um, then the specialized products that they would have to have, the amount of space these products take up, the inventory that, has to, that it would turn over, um, increased appointment length and things of that nature uh, basically made this concept not worthwhile for us. It wouldn't really help us. So where do we go from here? What we kind of step, took a step back and said what we're really trying to do is develop a means to provide guidance and direction for those patients who could not follow up in person. Um, I say could not, but then there's also a few patients who will just will not follow up in person. But if we can find those people and figure out a way to help them, it's not necessarily as good as seeing them in person, but hopefully we can bridge that gap and potentially with some experience make it as good as seeing them in person. So what we wanted to do was set up a synchronous telemedicine capability at the burn center. So for those folks who are uh, familiar with telemedicine, what that typically entails is, now this is from typically with the use of behavioral medicine or internal medicine or family medicine, but it entails the patient and the nurse are at some sort of clinic, um, can be really anywhere, um, and the provider is not located at that location, right? It's very simple. Um, there's some sort of telemedicine cart, there's a camera, uh, the nurse can interview the patient, the nurse can do the interventions and things that, of that nature, um, just gets the advice from the provider. But what we wanted to do was this, um, if the patient can't come to us, then we can't have a nurse with them. So basically, it's the patients at home. They have a cell phone. Our nurse and our provider are in clinic. How can we reach out to them, assess their wound appropriately, provide them with the instruction and guidance they need to take care of their wound, and then follow up as necessary? So that was our goal. So what we did. Uh, at the time, the uh, Department of Defense's uh, telemedicine platform was Adobe Connect. Um, it's just a uh, telemedicine or telemeeting platform uh, that we used. Um, so what we did was a case-by-case -case selection of patients uh, for this kind of initial run uh, based on the size of the wound, the intensity of the wound care, the, the dressing needs and so forth, the pain medication requirement, the anticipated PTO team need. So basically pick patients we were very safe that um, they weren't going to need anything that significant so we wouldn't have to do a lot of explaining or anything on the phone or over the, the telemedicine encounter. So prior to discharge, we walked these patients through uh, setting up, uh, installing the app on their cell phone, um, how to use it. We did a test run with them. Uh, we, any, there's certain consents that have to be done for telemedicine, consents for uh, photography and video and things of that nature. And importantly, we worked out contingency plans. We said, hey, if this doesn't work out, or if we see something we don't really like, what are we gonna do about it? Um, either these people were gonna be able to come in, say, the next day, or they were gonna have to go to their emergency room co-located, but that was worked out with each individual patient um, prior to discharge from the hospital. So our initial run of 10 patients, uh, each patient had one uh, virtual encounter. We basically selected patients that uh, were admitted and discharged, we felt comfortable that if we only saw them one time, they could be released uh, from our care. Uh, then to date, uh, with follow-up of these patients, we've had no negative outcomes that we're aware of. Uh, we, at the time, we had no technical issues uh, with uh, the telemedicine encounter during the encounters. Um, and overall, the patient satisfaction was 
expectedly high given the ease of use of the system. And then there's, of course, the no need for the long drive for the clinic. You can just wake up in your underwear, you turn, open up a, the link on your, um, your email, and you can have a cell phone encounter with the doc. You can show them the burn and things like that. And then it's over. So this is it. This was our very first encounter. What you see on the picture on the left um, is our uh, PA who sees all of our patients in clinic and does a fantastic job with and his computer. On his computer, the screen on the right shows the patient. The, the, on the left, you can see our nurse. So the nurse who's in her office, has her own uh, computer who's in on this, this telemeeting. Um, she can beforehand, she goes and initiates the note. She initiates the interview with the patient. And then when she's ready, she lets the provider know who can uh, go to his email, click on the link, and open up the encounter. Now, what is our challenge, our primary challenge that we encountered here was if you look at the picture to the right, this is basically a screenshot of the patient's wound. Can anybody tell me what that burn actually, can you tell that there's a burn on that hand? Right, yeah. So it's, it becomes a little bit of a challenge. So the challenges we had, now, big scheme, step back, you're gonna tell a patient how to take care of this wound, right? You're gonna to need to tell them they're gonna to need to get their own wound care supplies. What kind of wound care supplies? Where do they get them? Um, you can write prescriptions for certain types of medications, but they're gonna to have to potentially go to Walmart or Walgreens or CVS to buy things like gauze and things like that. Um, you can't necessarily prescribe them narcotic medication if they can't come see you. So patients who are unwilling to follow up, pain control is an issue. So, um, and then, big scheme, Looking at patients who have uh, burns to their uh, over joints or things of that nature where you're con significantly concerned about rehab, we are very limited in our experience to be able to necessarily assess the, the functional status and the extremity range of motion um, for those patients. So that's, that's a big limit for us. But the biggest one, like I said, is for us, it's the poor image resolution. So with our Department of Defense uh, system and our computer system is very, very secure. It also has a lot of th those firewalls that make us secure actually do a little bit of video, uh, uh, video resolution degradation such that our high resolution images are not very high resolution. So for this encounter, the patient sees us in high resolution. If you pulled out your cell phone and entered the same encounter, you would see them in high resolution. You could do a very good job of assessing the wound. But then on our computers, it doesn't do that. And we think it's important for us to be able to do this on our computers because then we can do screenshots of what the wound looks like and put it in the chart. That way, as we see the patient progressively over time, we can follow their wound progression. What's challenging about these encounters um, and where there's a little bit more of a, a learning curve is if you're the provider sitting um, in, the, in your clinic and this patient's at home and you want to be able to assess this wound, you have to look at them and say, all right, well now, turn your hand this way, move the camera over there. I'm trying to see if there's, a, if there's epithelialization. I'm trying to see if, um, if I'm concerned about redness or swelling or anything of that nature. That can be quite challenging. Um, and if you've never done it before, try and explain that to the patient. So what we believe is the way forward, uh, being able to overcome these challenges, it will, will allow us to provide one better care for large remote uh, populations. Um, but it alleviate the patient's need to drive hundreds of miles, further economic burden what they've already sustained, improve our ability to take care of patients around the world. Um, and what we need to do to facilitate this is, and what's happening is incorporating a system with increased uh, high resolution uh, video. Then once we get that, then learning ourselves how we um, tell the patient how to do self wound care. How do we assess the wound and how do we relate it to the patient how to do that? Um, and then with that comes more experience uh, with uh, the rehab needs that the patient will have. Do I have any questions? Well, thank you so much for allowing us to come and uh, present some of our data um, with regards to infection control within our, our burn center. Um, I have nothing to disclose. So I don't think it's just over the past decades, but certainly, you know, we've had problems with the emergence of multidrug resistant organisms throughout multiple of our societies, and certainly this impacts our patient population with the increasing mortality rates, increasing length of stay, um, increasing cost in the utilization of resources. Um, you know, this, this was brought to light even more so in 2013, where the American Hospital Association began to address these issues 
um, with a little more aggressive approach. Soon afterwards, JCO, CDC joined in and recommended the implementation of an antibiotic stewardship program. Our facility, and in, 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 you know, with with these other uh, these other agencies suggesting, you know, proactively went after this and instituted several infection control policies, looking at hand, you know, hygiene compliance, looking at our personal protective. Um, equipment as well as an antibiotic stewardship program. And the goal of this, this talk is to show you our, our utilization of our safety and quality team and a multidisciplinary approach to longitudinally look at our infection control processes over time. So as part of our just standard infection control policies, we review our infection control data monthly. We, we utilize it both in our, our morbidity and mortality conference, but we also have a, a quality and safety program that meets once a month and reviews all these programs. And unfortunately, what we, what we demonstrated or what we saw was we were getting sort of an increased risk of infections, primarily as, as all of us in the room have seen, you know, in Clapsy and Cotties. Um, and but we also saw an increase in our multiple drug ooh, I'm sorry our multiple drug resistant organisms, especially Acinobacter and E. coli. Um, so that wasn't the 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 cricks of it. We actually saw that our hand hygiene was just unacceptable. We were right around 70 percent across our entire service. And so when we looked at this data, we felt that, you know, this obviously needed to be addressed and needed to be addressed in a multidisciplinary fashion. So we took it back to our safety and quality meeting uh, and we initiated a burn QI project. And the goal of that project was simply to evaluate our current infection control prop, uh, practices for compliance. Were we utilizing things in place and were we being compliant with what we had in place? But we also wanted to determine if we needed to develop new policies and procedures to you know, augment the ones that we already had, um, and so our infection rates and this and this program was presented at our safety and quality meeting, and what we knew is we had to utilize our entire quality improvement structure. I'm a big believer that structure gives you function, so this wasn't just going to be one committee. It was going to take our entire quality improvement structure to make a move in this direction, and so we utilized our entire structure. So the first thing we sort of did is, you know, we looked at the fishbone of infection. So when I think you're, you're looking at multiple drug resistant organisms, you know, the best prevention of that is to prevent all infections. And especially with hospital acquired. There's not much we can do when those organisms come in from the outside, but certainly, you know, we can do some things by preventing infection to prevent the, the emergence of these multiple drug resistant organisms. So this is just a little bit of a representation of what we went through in terms of looking at the fishbone of infection from admission to discharge, knowing that each one of these components was extremely important. You have one break at any component of this and you're going to increase your risk of infection. So. Each service line that was associated with our facilities was given instructions to go back, look at how they were doing with re regards to compliance to each one of our policies and procedures, and then determine if they needed to develop anything new. And that was brought back to our meeting. We meted monthly and we, we came up with a solution or a, a process uh, to move this forward. And each, each service group presented monthly about their movement forward with regards to this uh, process. This was a multidisciplinary approach. It was all service lines involved in turning our, our burn medicine folks, our pharmacy, nursing, burn infection control, as well as burn education. So when we sat down and we looked at our fishbone, unfortunately what we found is, is that about every aspect of this fishbone needed to be addressed. And so as I sort of said, that we felt that each one, small or large, needed to be addressed. So we systematically went about looking at each one of these components and what could we do to improve things. So I'm going to give you just a representation, not the complete, but a representation of what we did over this period of time. So with regards to decontamination, not only of the room, right, between patients, but also the patient upon admission, we actually looked at our standard cleansing and when we had compliance, we had fancy magic markers that we could look with black lights to ensure that our folks are doing good terminal cleans. There really wasn't in our industry um, a standardized cleaning of a burn ICU room so that you have the good policies and procedures. So we actually collaborated with an outside agency to come up with a standard procedure so that we can ensure that our rooms are cleaned in the appropriate manner. 
We then monitor for compliance with that, as I suggested, fancy marker and some black light. We also brought in the utilization of a UV robot, not only between patients, but actually with our large burns as they travel to the operating room, we go ahead and clean the room, provide the UV robot to try to keep the colonization of those rooms down as much as possible, understanding that it's, it's a difficult uh, thing to keep into control. With regards to hand hygiene, PPE utilization, OR infection control practices, our burn quality nurse has an ATP monitoring device that looks at residual organic material after cleansing. Weekly, we go through our entire burn center and we're swabbing all sorts of things to suggest are we doing a good job in cleaning. This gives you a quantitative result and you can give real-time feedback to folks of what kind of job they're doing. But most importantly, if you're doing a good job, positive reinforcement. So candy works real well. So my, my burn quality nurse walks around and swabs somebody's hands, and if you've got a good, you know, done a good job with your hands, you get a piece of candy. It's amazing how little food, little candy does a long ways. But again, positive reinforcement for folks that are doing a good job, and I think it sort of stems in a positive direction. With regards to our central lines, obviously, you know, proper technique and insertion, but also maintenance. You know, our HCG dressings, our silver dressings, where are they being put? Our charge nurses went through the charts looking for compliance with regards to documentation, but then also real-time bedside evaluation to ensure that we are doing it appropriately. With regards to IV access, um, you know, scrub the hub. I suggest that all of you guys go look at how people are accessing your central access. So, you know, most people scrub the hub, that's alcohol-based, 10 seconds in duration and allow it to clean and allow it to dry. We found poor compliance with that. So again, further education, further compliance, making sure that when you access the lines to administer medications, you are not secondarily contaminating uh, those access points. Discontinuization of lines, all of our rounds, both in the ICU and the IDT rounds or well as floor lines, have to justify any line being in place daily. And if you can't justify it, then those lines get pulled out. And then finally, antibiotic stewardship program. We have a very close working relationship between microbiology, our burn intensivists, as well as um, <clears throat> our pharmacists in terms of down escalation of, of uh, drugs as quickly as possible. But one of the things that we did institute was an antibiotic, excuse me, was a uh, wound surveillance cultures. Uh, weekly on our bigger burns, we actually surveil our patients' wounds uh, for what organisms are present. This is not to dictate treatment, but what it does do, it allows, our, it allows us to understand what organisms are probably colonized on our patients and potential risk for infection. If we start developing multiple drug resistance, it allows me to send those, those organisms off for e-testing. So perhaps if I have a patient beginning to show signs and symptoms of systemic infection, I can go ahead and target with monotherapy based on my e-testing versus having to do big shotgun multiple antibiotics, which certainly I don't think works in the favor of maintaining low levels of multi-drug resistant organisms. So how did this all work out? Worked out pretty well. So with regards to hand hygiene, we're up at 96%. So across the system, 96%, but we've, breaking, we've broken it down even more, made it a little competitive. Each one of our components, be it the floor, the ICU, the clinic, we compete against one another. And we did it one step further. We compete physicians against other staff. This is presented at our morbidity and mortality conference monthly to see who might be the ones that need to step their game up, but a little competition never hurts. And then certainly we were able to bring our infection, our, our central line infection rate as well as our CAUTIs down to what would be acceptable levels. And I'm actually very proud to state that with regard to our central lines, um, you can see that what, oops, I'm gonna keep hitting the wrong button, I'm sorry. What, when it comes to central lines, when you look at your, observe, your actual to observe um, or predicted infections, we are actually doing quite well currently and actually we're doing better than the hospital. So I always think that our burn center should be driving the infection control practices for the hospital. The biggest thing that I think we got out of this is we present our meeting to, do, to a division which looks at hospitals throughout our, our centers. And the biggest, I think, compliment that we had is and when we were reviewing this data, um, they said, well, Usually, our hospitals are complaining that they're associated with the burn center, so the infection rates are higher. And they said, well, Dr. Mullins and Dr. Fagan must be really upset that their burn center is affiliated with a hospital that's screwing up their infection control centers. 
But this is what I think we should strive for, is to drive what is proper policies and procedures and then share those with the hospital so that we can uh, take care of not only our population, but the all patients that come to the hospital. So, you know, we did see some reduction in our multiple drug resistant organisms, but some, you know, we still have to work each and every day to, to keep these lower. This is just graphically represented, you know, this is that high spike we saw in Acinobacter and E. coli. Um, but the red line just demonstrates where we're at right now after completion of this project. So, in conclusion, I think, you know, with a multi uh, disciplinary approach, Utilizing the resources that we have, you can impact both your infection rates and hopefully then impact your multiple drug resistant organisms. That being said, it's not about just having one shot data, it's about maintenance, right? So continued education, continued monitoring of compliance is extremely important in this aspect um, that we continue to do to this day. You know, so with, with this multidisciplinary uh, process. I think we've had some impact. The goal is to maintain this improvement um, and to continue forward. Obviously, this was a huge project, great people that I get to work with and have done fantastic jobs across our centers. Some of them are acknowledged here, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, good. Afternoon or evening. I'm Dr. Short and I'm the medical director at Baton Rouge General uh, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'd like to thank the Southern Region for allowing me to present this topic. Um, given that I've seen a few talks uh, that have already been presented as well as some posters, it's a hot topic in most of our units. So I'd like to, to dive in because I'd like to see what converse, uh, conversations and potential controversies it might uh, provoke. I have no disclosures regarding this topic. Um, so essentially kind of where did the idea and concept of uh, presenting about opioids as a physician uh, come from? Um, so you can imagine um, operating on a patient and then when you get home, uh, you send them home with a prescription or in this case we actually send them electronically and they call us saying that the patient you just operated on can't get their prescriptions filled. Well now what do you do? They're not in your institution anymore. Uh, or you have a patient who's now gone through the worst experience that you can imagine. They've survived this catastrophic uh, burn injury, and their first uh, problem as to why they're now not participating in therapy is because they're worried about becoming addicted to their pain meds. Uh, and then, you know, the next thing that you get is the, the patient's gone home, the survivor's at home, their family members call back. Um, we've weaned them off their IV meds. We found a regimen that worked. We're like, everyone's on board for a good home plan, only to find out that the pharmacy's policy won't fill their meds. Uh, so what sparked uh, this sudden change in practice? Uh, change is always good, um, but have we simply blanketed uh, a problem and then instituted a change to a, a population that wasn't necessarily the reason for the problem? So the Department of Health and Services actually says that there's about 32,656 people who die from a non-heroin, non-methadone-related opioid overdose every year. So these are the numbers that they report as being up as to why you can now get Narcan free, but an EpiPen still runs you $600. In 2018, 2 million people uh, reported misusing opioids for the first time. Uh, roughly 20 to 29 percent of uh, people report that um, prescribed opioids uh, in chronic pain users were misused. So the patient actually reported misusing the medication in chronic pain patients. Uh, in 2013, uh, 2.8 million illicit drug users were identified uh, by the Council on Drug Abuse. 70% of that 2.8 million said that marijuana was their first drug exposure, with 17% of that population saying that prescription pain relievers was their first uh, drug exposure. And then on average, the number that you'll hear touted uh, in the media, it was even on NPR, is that opioid abuse causes $179 billion annually to the U.S. budget. So let's back up a second. Um, we're talking about narcotics, but for a moment, we're gonna shift to alcohol. So according to the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, which is legal, and in the state of Louisiana, you can buy it at the, at the grocery store, uh, 88,000 people die annually from alcohol-related deaths. That is actually still more than opioids. Um, and I don't have to write a prescription for your Jack Daniels. 
In 2017, 14 million adults and 443,000 12 to 17 year olds had actually had an alcohol uh, use disorder diagnosed. Um, and alcohol misuse costs the U.S. $249 billion annually, but I don't hear in the news about an alcohol epidemic. So here's what actually I found interesting when I, when I probed into the data. In a lot of these places, people reported that marijuana was their first illicit drug exposure back in 2013, but in many states across the country, marijuana is no longer an illicit drug. So therefore, that percentage that used to be 17% is now a larger percent because the population that just got exposed to drugs for the first time, 12 to 17, they grew up with mom and dad smoking weed and it wasn't illegal, right? So it kind of shifts the perspective and shifts the percentages. So how does this problem with chronic pain now translate into our acute pain patients? I'm not gonna say that I ignore the problem. It is definitely something that makes me look at my practice and figure out how to change it. Um, but does everything need to be thrown out um, with the baby in the bathwater? So Louisiana state law actually made a change that we had to intentionally write on each prescription if a, uh, a narcotic prescription was gonna require more than seven days of administration. The interesting part to that is each commercial pharmacy can decide whether they want to follow that policy or not. So therefore, not what I've written and what's good for my patient is actually what's enacted. It's it's actually at the discretion of whatever pharmacy that patient then chooses to take their prescriptions to. Um, one of the things that this has resulted in is now we have to see people back weekly because they can't get more than seven days worth of pain medicine and or the patients are rationing their medications and when they come back we're like, are you participating in therapy? And they're like, well, no, it hurts. And we're like, well, why didn't you take your meds? And they're like, well, I cut it in half to make it last longer because I was going to run out. Is this really the ideal situation that we're discharging people home uh, in an area where we're trying to not keep them in-house, but now we actually can't send them home uh, because they're not getting the care that they need? Several of our phone calls actually uh, have resulted in we intentionally now tell our patients what pharmacies we recommend or would let them know what pharmacies they would have difficulty filling their prescriptions at. That shouldn't be the role of the physician, should it? Um, so where we come from, Walmart actually will not issue a prescription for more than four pills per day. So now as a doctor, I have to figure out, do I write for 30 milligrams and think that the patient will cut it in half? Or do I write them for the 10 and hope they can just make do? Right? If, I'm, if the patient has a history of maybe not being the most trustworthy, I'm definitely not sending them home with 30, hoping that they'll cut it in half according to the prescription instructions. In CVS, they actually won't, write a, they won't fill a pain prescription for anyone under the age of five. But I operated on them. That doesn't mean that they don't have pain, they just can't fill at CVS. Um, and then according to some of our Medicaid plans, we can actually get them ready for discharge home, and unless they've had prior authorization, their insurance company will deny the, the filling the cost of their meds, and so the families have to pay for it out of pocket. So how do we kick pain's butt and then figure out how we can also comply with all of the rules as well as try to change some modalities to kind of make navigating the system a little bit easier? So I actually was in attendance at a meeting, I don't remember which one I was at, and the, comp, uh, the concept of ERAS, or Enhanced Recovery After Surgery, was introduced. It originally was a multimodal, multidisciplinary approach to the management of improving post-surgical complications that were related to surgery, and one of the arms included controlling pain. It was developed back in 2001, introduced by the European group, and it looked at kind of all of the facets of care that are, are associated with recovery and how do you minimize complications. Now, this is quite complicated, but essentially what I want you to show is that it looks at all facets of a surgical patient, from pre-admission to pre-op to intra-op and post-op, and every person that's involved in that team along the way plays a role in whether or not this patient is able to comply with the algorithm. So from pre-admission, it comes from things like um, smoking cessation, and then pre-admission plays a role in pre-op. Uh, what they found was that if a patient actually carb loads right before surgery, then they actually do have decreased decreased pain, decreased post-off nausea, and related to their anesthetic. So in PACU, we actually are having the patient drive in drinking a clear protein and uh, carb substance prior to surgery. Totally defies that NPO concept, but it works. Uh, the next aspect from pre-op comes with prophylaxis, both an infection prophylaxis and throm uh, uh, thrombolytics. 
Um, it looks at whether things like bowel preps are needed. But then from an intra-op standpoint, it actually dictates not using those long-acting uh, anesthetics or using more regionals or epidurals. Um, it's monitoring things like temp, which we're you know, pretty experts at temps. Um, and then the post-op part that we're going to deep dive into was use of anti-inflammatories and pain control. So yes, uh, I and my pharmacist uh, actually tried to figure out how can we collaborate to find alternatives to uh, help make uh, this work for our patients. Um, because at the time it wasn't rolling out in our burn department, so I set about doing a, quite a QI to kind of see whether or not the changes that we were making on a case-by-case -case scenario could potentially extrapolate to a change that we make to, made across the service line. So initially, uh, we only looked at what we called the difficult patients. We've all had them. The ones who are not narcotic naive, some of them are active opioid users, or they have very low thresholds of pain despite the fact that they're on a pretty normal dose of narcotics. And what I did is I looked at what was their uh, morphine milligram equivalents that was required three days prior to the day of change, the day that a protocol was changed, and then the average of the three days afterwards. So here's a graph of that. So in patient one, the average of the three days leading up to the day of change was 55 um, morphine uh, equivalents. The day of the change, uh, which would be expected, that's the day where you're having escalation in the amount of pain med that they're needing, that's when one of those changes were made in the ERAS concept. And then after implementing that sort of modified ERAS, the MME average for the day went to 27. Even in the patients who had high MMEs, they still implemented a decrease from where they had started prior to the change. Um, of note, one of the patients on here was an active user and one was a Suboxone user, uh, hence why some of these numbers are on the high side. So the concept was, is if it could work for them, could it work for your average uh, non uh, or narcotic naive patient? Some of the limitations in this is the fact that it's retrospective. We only looked at three patients. They were kind of selected to see if it would work. Um, but are you going to do a complete service line without seeing if it at least worked in a few patients that you decided to make a change in? Um, the other aspect of things is regardless of whether the patient went to the OR for the day or not, the MMEs were still calculated. But that's the reason why we looked at the full week. That way it would account for before and after the change if the patient was on dressing holidays or was post-op and was drowsy and hadn't had had that many narcotics for the day. So in looking at that data and working with our pharmacists, what we actually came up with was a modified ERAS for the burn unit. And so what we had decided was that we were going to do the extended release acetaminophen. We do the 1,300 milligrams Q8. We do scheduled Celebrex. Um, yes, we actually did find that the risk of bleeding with the operations actually did not go up. And we do make and have limitations for creatinine clearance, age, and so forth. Um, we put people on scheduled Lyrica, melatonin, and gum chewing. My pharmacist threw that one in. Um, and then when it came to the PRNs, then they had um, across the board, um, dependent upon the ox, uh, on oxycodone based on their pain uh, perception or pain score, and then they had the IV for the extreme breakthrough. But that's not all we changed. One of the things that we had to change was how we determine what pain is. So we were unable to go by the, the traditional scale of your pain is one to three, this is what you get. Your pain is four to six, this is what you get. And then because what we found in doing this deep dive in our QI is let's say someone was requesting the moderate dose pain med, but then they still had pain in three hours. Well, according to protocol, they would get an IV narcotic as opposed to just getting the extra of the pain pill, right? Because that was how the, the nursing algorithm went. That wasn't necessarily how we wrote it or what we intended for it to be, but that was actually the policy of the hospital. They were not able to give that extra dose because that wasn't the breakthrough medicine. Um, and being a patient myself, I remember I only wanted some Aleve or some Tylenol, but according to the scale, I had to have whatever dose. We're so used to people kind of fudging the scale, saying they're a 10 because they want more meds, but there's just as many people who don't want more meds, but they don't have that option uh, according to our PRN algorithms. So now uh, we had to go to policies, and so PRN, you can actually give a low dose, and in 30 minutes they can redose with that low dosed PRN. In. So let's say they only got five of oxycodone in 30 minutes. If they're still having pain, they're not getting your breakthrough Dilaudid. They can get another five of the oxycodone. So our new uh, 
ERAS for burn um, actually uh, includes diet modifications, which goes back to adding on chewing gum, which I heard was uh, quite a challenge for a PNT committee. Who knew picking a gum would be that difficult? Um, <laughs> All the, <clears throat> excuse me, all the way to what our parameters were going to be for whether or not we give Celebrex or hold the Celebrex, um, whether um, they're getting the 75 BID of the Lyrica or getting the 50 BID, and then based on age, whether they're getting the full 1300 or the 650 of the Tylenol. But remember, ERAS was not just pain, it was multimodal. So we also made some additional changes to our order sets that included things like muscle relaxants, lines of nausea control, um, things for itch. The funny part that I learned through this whole process is I usually throw people uh, Benadryl and Atarax when they start itching. And my pharmacist is like, well, that might be a sign that you need to decrease your pain med. Um, and so it was a very interesting dialogue while we were working through this process um, that we were then able to implement into an order set. One of the other things, which was why it was listed on our, our order set and, and why we changed what we did, if you notice all of our scheduled meds were at Q8. Um, and that nighttime Q8 included a dose of melatonin. So the typical um, um, adage that we're working towards is that the patients can actually sleep through the evening. So they get loaded with a, a pain med right before bed, they get loaded with their PRN med, they took their nighttime Lyrica, so the hope is that they're not on Q8 vital sign or Q4 or Q6, they can actually sleep through the night, which does improve pain perception, and then they awake and the pain has been controlled. We actually have been able to get many people by with the extended release Tylenol in the cases of when they run out of meds, and you can actually buy it over the counter because it's Tylenol arthritis. So what's next? As I mentioned, we had to go to policy committee. We were able to get the things changed that we needed to uh, in order to make this policy really work. Um, it went from being rolled out in a single physician um, utilization to it actually be the standard order set for all of the burn patients. Um, and then what we intend to do is study formally once we do this rollout throughout the entire service line is whether or not it actually did make a change in the amount of narcotics that were administered. My personal bias is that I don't think it's going to change the perception of pain, so I think the pain scores may remain the same, but I would like to see what that uh, um, uh, weathers out in the data. And I'd like to thank uh, Jerry Karasis, he was one of our medical students, for helping mine the data, my nursing staff for flexibility, because this required a significant amount of change. Uh, my pharmacist, uh, Dr. Leslie Dixon, and again to the Southern Burn. Any questions? What we're gonna look at is the real world data uh, placed into the economic model that we presented several years ago at this meeting. Uh, it's actually not my paper, but that uh, joined from the uh, Southern uh, folks here with uh, Dr. Carter Griswold, Holmes, and Dr. Jones, in addition, uh, utilizing the Beacon model that was developed in collaboration uh, with Avita and uh, also with BARDA. Those are my disclosures. And basically, the economic model that we're looking at is what we're dealing with. We've got burn care that we all know is incredibly expensive. And I think Dr. Orlett would tell you that the things that we're doing now are a lot more expensive than the things that he was doing back in his days in San Francisco. But the cost effectiveness of that is rarely assessed. So this model basically then takes into consideration things from the wound assessment when the first patient first comes in, through any of the excision or treatment that we do, temporary coverage, permanent clo closure then, down to the rehab phase. And what we're trying to do is see if we can come up with the different modalities that we'll be utilizing in the future to decrease our length of stay, decrease the risk of infection, both with the wounds as well as hospital acquired. And Dr. Fagan, I applaud you for what you're doing. Maybe you can uh, come in and clean us up. Um, and looking then to improve our overall quality of life, much like what Dr. Chaffee was talking about this morning. And doing that then from things that Dr. Wolf has been preaching to us for years with uh, the uh, financial model. So the cost effectiveness portion of this model looks at the wound assessment, debridement, again, temporary permanent closure, on into rehab. And it tracks that individual patient from their burn injury 
to the outcomes, understanding the cost as well as what we're doing for quality at that point. The budget impact then can be used to represent each individual unit with their standard of care. Where do you stand, what you're looking at, how you can take that and focus in on these different techniques. And in this case, what we were looking at was the autologous skin cell suspension and how that intervention will impact not only the patients but also the hospitals utilizing those forms of treatment. So our objectives in the study was to survey current burn care practices and compare that to the MBR data. Benchmark these emerging trends nationally and regionally against the MBR version eight, uh, because that's what we had to work with at this point, and integrate the data into the Beacon model to assess the autologous skin cell suspension's impact on current burn care. So the Beacon model, uh, anyone that knows Dr. Iyer at BARDA knows that he comes up with all of these nice little acronyms. And BEACON stands for the BURN Medical Countermeasure Effectiveness Assessment Cost Outcomes Nexus. So can you see why he doesn't just call it BEACON? Okay, I mean, you know. But looking forward with that then, we surveyed 10% or 14 of the U.S. BURN centers, including five of those here in the southern region compared the key burn center and patient characteristics, how they existed, resource utilization between the southern region and the national sample to see where we really stood. And then the aggregate national averages were integrated into the Beacon model to see where we stood with the impact of the autology of skin cell substitutes. And so, you know, we're really looking at the evolving trends in the inpatient care what's going on with what we're seeing in these compared across the nation uh, with MBR. So the patient mix, what we saw compared to what we presented earlier was that we're seeing more severe burns managed as an inpatient at this point, both in the southern region as nationally. More superficial partial thickness injury are being managed as outpatients, so therefore you get the key going down, the green one saying that the burn admissions are down from that point. Cost, we'll look at it a little differently on the next slide, but what we're seeing is that it's about the same as we go across, but that in the southern region being down for the burn bed, a little up maybe for anesthesia. But for resource use, average surgical time for the graft sites increased. The average size for the total body surface area for the donor sites decreased from the national standpoint, but increased in our region in these areas. And that may be because of an increase in utilizing the autologous skin cell substitutes or doing larger burns at one point, because you'll see that our number of procedures are less than that national average in just a minute and the average time for dressing changes increased, and you would expect that, I think, with larger burns. So cost for burns per day, it's down in the south compared to the national average. Surgery in the operating room is about the same across the, the, the corridors there, and cost of anesthesiology may be a little up. Average number of patients treated inpatiently for us was down compared to the national average but our full thickness and deep partial thickness averages were increased. When we look at the Beacon model then, the results of that compared the standard of care to oncologist skin cell substitutes across the region then, we would see a savings of some $10 million or almost 17%. Now obviously all of these patients won't get that, but this was the projection if they did to improve the shortness of stay and outcome that we would see with that. The national average, it would be even more because obviously the, with what they saw with the cost that they had as well. So an average savings of some 37,000 in the South and 43 nationally. When we took those results and looked at a few other things though, what we saw was that decreasing trends in autograph procedures 
And for us, what we saw with the number of autograft procedures were 1.5 and 1.78 for part full thickness and deep partial thickness compared to 2.5 and 2.14 for the national average. So I would say that we're probably doing larger burns at once uh, as opposed to the national average. In conclusion, we feel that the study provides an update on burn care practice in the pattern since the induction of the MBR version 8. Using this provides an assessment of what can occur with autologous skin cell substitute to take back to your units. And in the future, this same model will be able to be used, hopefully, as we go forward uh, for other products as well as each one of the centers can use this. It's going to be interesting to see how this really plays out, who will be able to use based upon uh, some of the cost. Will it be those that are going to be verified burn centers? Will it be those that are going to be part of the consortium of hospitals within the ABA? We'll be uh, yet to see, I think. But more severe patient mix increases costs and resource use, and uh, the ASCS then reduces the resource consumption and can help lower the burn cost. Key drivers, obviously, the patient mix. Inpatient cost per day, the operating room cost, and the number of autograph procedures overall. And then when you look at the southern region, a lower cost structure than the national average and more patients to the outpatients area that we're seeing now as well.